Hello, everyone. Welcome to Queerly Recommended, the podcast where we recommend queer films, books, TV shows, and more. I'm Chris Bryant, a contemporary romance writer for Bold Strokes Books, and this week I'm recommending a documentary from 2011. And I'm Tara Scott. I review sapphic fiction at the Lesbian Review and Smart Bitches Trashy Books. And this week I'm recommending a documentary that was released last year because we are clearly in our documentary era. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for nothing strikes. I mean, I think we would have probably ended up here anyway at some point because we do like a good documentary, we but do. like we are truly in our documentary era at the moment. <laughs> we just want to take a minute to thank everyone who supports the show through coffee, signing up for our newsletter. We do have links to both of those in our show notes. Thank you for the reviews and the ratings on the apps. But if you can just tell a friend about the show, I mean, that's, you know, sharing is caring and mm -hmm. everybody needs a little more queer media in their life lately. I agree. So Chris, we're going to talk about what's new. Something okay. I noticed <laughs> is that you had a very special drunk guest on your Patreon recently. Yes, I did. I, I convinced my sister to have a drunk interview with me. Uh, we were both drinking, but she started way ahead. And <laughs> when I picked her up, she was like, hey, what's going on? So she was already like at least a, like a glass or two into it. And apparently but, said nice pajamas. <laughs> yes. So like she gets all dolled up and I'm like wearing a hoodie and some flannel pants. And I pick her up. She's like, what the hell? I thought we were dressing up for this. <laughs> like, well this is who you are and this is who i am so wait she thought that you were dressing up for a podcast right well, like yeah i mean it's you know obviously people can see her so she wants to make uh, a good impression oh right and right, i'm right. like eh, everybody knows what i look like <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay but mm -hmm. uh yeah so she uh she came on the sh on uh patreon and and we zoomed some questions that patrons ha asked about me about what it was like growing up with me as a sister and we just went off on so many different tangents. I mean, it was just, it was so much fun. We had a great time. And the next morning, like my sister said, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> she drank, <laughs> like she ended up, I think it was a total of six glasses of wine. <gasps> she was, oh, she no. was wrecked. Yeah, she was wrecked. So, and it was funny because, you know, she, <laughs> it was just, it was a good time. And the patrons loved it, I think. So far, I mean, oh, the people yeah. who have seen it have all said, like, great thing, you know, great things about it. Because it's always nice to get to know somebody, especially, and my sister didn't see the answers ahead of time, or the questions ahead of time. So mm -hmm. it was like, straight on, here's this answer. What am I like? Or what what was this? And so, yeah. so uh, people got to hear a lot about us growing up, you know, especially uh, not here in the United States. So that was fun. Yes. Yeah, I've seen the first quarter, and it is so so funny like I knew right <laughs> off the bat it was gonna be so fun because I feel I can spoil the first five seconds, oh sure right oh sure so it opens with Chris saying hello patrons or something like that and then both of you just completely dissolve into <laughs> giggles and I was like oh it's oh, yeah. gonna be great <laughs> and so far yes it's, it's uh it's a lot fabulous. of fun i've i had to watch it back because my sister's like did i say anything wrong and oh. i said well let me go check and so yeah. i watched it back and yeah so it's all good she didn't not wrong but just like anything she might regret <laughs> right it's one of those the 24-hour regret after you've had a lot of alcohol like what did i do what uh -huh. did i say she was just unsure did she say something that might have like made me look bad or whatever <laughs> so yeah yeah i'm like yes you did but that's kind of the point of it you know <laughs> so well yeah people are literally asking for embarrassing moments <laughs> like oh yeah what else is gonna happen oh yeah <laughs> i also heard you have some pretty exciting day job news yes so i fought for a, a promotion and got it so yes. i'm like a project manager too and i handle mm -hmm. Lots of projects now that are worth a lot of money. So yeah. I'm actually creating right now on my living room floor. I have a giant whiteboard mm -hmm. and I have to, I'm adding lines and everything and, and trying to, so I can color coordinate. I'm actually color coordinating it. Mm -hmm. uh, my jobs, all the jobs that I have, I have six jobs so far. It's just going to like increase. It's just going to get bigger and bigger as we get into the season. 
So I need to find, you know, I can do it all electronically and it's there, but I like to actually see something like right in front of me. Like, what do I got? Oh, just okay. look at it and say, oh yeah, this is due. I got to get this done or get final invoice or whatever. So there are things that I need to do. And I, it's so easy to ignore it when it's just a, a document, mm-hmm. you know, just on the computer. But when I have this board staring at me, it's just, I'm old school in that way. Oh uh, yeah. They have us using software at work called Asana or Asana. I don't know how they pronounce it, mm-hmm. but it's good. It's helpful. And I but- suppose it's the only way if you have to have like accountabilities for a bunch of different people mm-hmm. on a project and like you're passing tasks back and forth. But I can also kind of see the appeal. Although I'd be mildly terrified of doing it on a whiteboard because uh, I mean, I don't it's know everywhere. that kids are chaotic. <laughs> Right. Uh, and I don't trust that I wouldn't come down and just be like, some of it's gone, but there's yeah. a drawing there now that was made by a child. Well, the good news is there aren't any children in my office. Makes and it it's like I said, it's also on the computer as well. It's just, yeah. it's just something I want. And so here's a true story. This yeah. is insane. Okay. So when I... I actually had quit my job way back when, Mm -hmm. and I helped this company start their eBay store. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I spent like, I was away for like 14 months and they came back and said, please come back. You know, we're Mm going to do this, this. And I go, great. I said, here's what I want. I want, this was like eight years ago. I'm like, Mm -hmm. I want the internet at my desk. We did not have access to the internet before. What? I, I want email at my desk. We did not have access to email before. We what? have two standalone computers. My boss is that paranoid that somebody's trying to steal his intellectual property that we did not have the internet. We had it on two standalone computers and how we survived and how we did as well as we did is, is blows my mm-hmm. mind. So, so when I came back, they did give me the internet and uh, email at my desk. And then eventually they gave everybody access, but they've blocked everything. Like I can't gamble or or buy drugs or alcohol What's or, the point? Or, or social media. I mean, so they have it all blocked, which is great. Cause you know, Google, I'll, I'll still use Google for everything, but mm-hmm. isn't that incredible? So for me having a whiteboard, I mean, my whole company, first yeah. of all, my state is 20 years behind everybody else. And then my company is 40 years behind everybody else. Mm-hmm. So a whiteboard just fits right in. Yeah. Forget everything I just said about right. Asana. You don't know. Like, I'm like, what? <laughs> what does that mean? Okay. I'm just nodding. Uh... Like, like, Okay, sure. (laughs) But if you ever decide that you do want to use it, let me know and I'll teach you. (laughs) Yeah, I have Excel and we have it in a shared, you know, shared file on the computer that everybody has access to. And so a lot of things, uh, because I also do a lot of inventory control, I've learned now to protect the documents (laughs) because people like to change shit on me. So I have learned to uh, protect that. So I am like probably now in 1990, I think so far. Woohoo! Congratulations! Yay. This yes. digital transformation is going to happen at some point. <laughs> ah, by the time I retire, we'll be fully mm-hmm. digitized. <laughs> it's underway. It is. So, so a lot, a lot's going on in my life. How about you? What's going on in yours? Well, the kids went back to school. Yay! <laughs> Who was it that did those commercials back in the day? Was it Target? I think where they would play the song. It's the most wonderful time of the year. That Christmas. <laughs> I don't know, but that's, I think you're right. I think you're right. Oh, it was so (laughs) funny. I mean, it was so far back. It was before I lived in Calgary. So probably around 20 years ago. And I always thought they were so funny, but didn't really get it. And then you have kids and you're like, "Ah." like, oh, I get it. Yes. (laughs) Especially like, I don't have an office to go to. My job is fully remote. But even then, like they were, they were really good. They weren't like super loud this summer very often or anything like that. There was just the occasional like, okay, why is one kid screaming? (laughs) What's happening? And if Neil's like not there, but still it was like, yeah, come on, go back to school. You'll see your friends every day. It's going to be great. They have been in school for a day and a half because for some reason our uh, school was like, yeah, you're going back on a Thursday. And I was like, yeah, that's good. Why? That's good because then the kid has, you know, the kids have time to adjust to a full week. Mm -hmm. So it gives them two days to get up early to, to get into a little bit of a routine because parents aren't exactly, I mean, my parents weren't like, oh, like two weeks before school, you should probably start getting your kids on a better schedule, sleeping schedule. And a lot of parents don't do that. It's easy for me to say like, oh, you should do this when I've never had kids, but yeah, yeah, that's hard to do. 
we sort of tried to do it sooner and it wasn't really working. But then that week, like last week was where it was like, nope, Monday, this is when you're getting up, even though it sucks. And then it was just like a hard moving it back half an yeah. hour until they were fine. And that worked out fine, which I mean, our eight year old, when we would let her, like she literally would sleep in until noon. Oh, yeah. Like that was just, which for an eight year old is wild. <laughs> The other kid wouldn't even sleep that late. But yeah, so they went back for um, a day and a half, which was also long enough for said eight-year-old to come home and be sick. Woo! Boo! I'm hoping it's just a cold. That would be nice. She seems to mostly be okay. I'm just hoping, like, please not COVID yet. Oh, I'm I know. sure it's going to happen, but I'd really rather not. I feel like I've had it enough. I don't, I don't need more. Yeah. I'm not interested. I don't think that anybody should have it anymore no. i certainly don't want it i mean knock on wood one two three i don't almost i almost don't want to say this but i've not had it yet that is wild that is wild because you know what i wear a mask and i wash my hands mm. and i stay away from big crowds it's like uh, mm -hmm. the other night deb's niece had a bunch of tickets to see the chicks and i'm like <laughs> no uh yeah yeah Fair. it's one of those there's just too many people and you know it's just i can't yeah and there's a wave there happening yet. right now yeah so. there's a way i would have done this like a year ago maybe mm -hmm. i would have felt more comfortable doing a concert yeah a big concert like that but yeah no yeah that's fair yeah. that's fair so chris yes what have you been reading watching or doing lately <laughs> so i don't know where i was going with the third verb <laughs> So I don't know what is happening to alone, like in Australia, you know, I, I uh, watched like the first two episodes, I think, and three people dropped out immediately. I mean, like, boom, 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 whoa. or four people, four people did. And then all of a sudden it's not on anymore. Like for the last two weeks, it hasn't been on. So I don't know what's going on. Oh, you should look that up. I should. I really should. Because every time I'm like, oh, it's Thursday night. Let's, let's turn it on at eight o'clock mm -hmm. and it's not on. Like it literally for the last two weeks. So I don't know if they're just, if they're going to scrap this because everybody's dropping. Like, I'm not lying when I said like in seven days, this would be over because where That's... they, where these people are, it's very like uninhabitable. It really is. It just sucks. I'm like, I don't know how I wouldn't last. I would last overnight and I would call in and say, like, come get me because it's just miserable for sure. I'm still editing. Mm -hmm. I actually forgot that I was editing somebody else's book and it's due tomorrow. <laughs> oh, so I okay. jumped back on it because I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to yeah. uh, get back on this. And this book is like a hundred thousand words. And I'm just like, huh? That's a, long, that's a long book. <laughs> it's a long book. So now at this point, I'm just story editing, you know, to make sure there aren't any like, or is even... it a romance? It is a romance. It's a romance. How... So for people that aren't familiar, like what is a typical length for a full length romance? I think anywhere from 75 to 80. Okay. So like if you were to look at GCLS guidelines, anything under 70 is a short contemporary romance mm -hmm. and 70 to 85 is mid length. And then anything, mm -hmm. anything over five is long is considered mm -hmm. long. Yeah. And, uh, my friend writes really long books and I didn't realize that when I got into this. I mean, it's a good book, but it's it's also like, I can't now look for every little thing, like every miss no. comma, every period. I can't at this point. Now we're just, and I found something that was really big. I found something and I, I like, I saw it and I called Ooh, it right away. I was like, like okay. a continuity error? No, something worse. I'm yeah. not going to, I'm, I'm You're not, not going to ask. Gonna ask. <laughs> You're not well, gonna ask. I, I do want to know, please tell me later. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I'll tell Listen you later. People, you'll be like, oh. sometimes so. I get secrets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tara is a, uh, I'm a secret has, keeper. I keep she, them to myself. She really does. She's very good at that. So, uh, but yes, we'll talk about it later. And then, so as of September 1st, I mm -hmm. am now focused. My summer is over. Mm -hmm. uh, my time off is over. So now I have to get back to, I have to buckle down and start writing. Ooh. And are you talking yeah. about what you're going to be writing or is it too soon? Oh, uh, no, this is the, uh, this is called Perfect. And it's the uh, non-binary character from my uh, Bachelorette story. Fun. So, yeah. So Alex gets their own story and it's not, it's not the actual TV show is in the background. It has nothing mm -hmm. really to do with the show. It's just Alex trying to find love. Yeah. After not finding it on the show. So. Fun. That sounds and it's lovely. third person. 
it's in third person thanks Chris to my Roberts. patrons i know we're doing third person like Whoa. i i was like how, how do we feel? feel about this i mean i have written a few like in third person especially yeah. i had to write uh i don't know i have like a handful of third person yeah yeah it's not my favorite form but you can certainly get a lot of words mm. like, oh yeah. yeah for sure <laughs> third person like i can actually fluff a novel enough to where like in first person, it would maybe show up at 65, but in third person, it's like 80. So when you're writing in third person, do, does it feel kind of like you're sprawling or like you're able to sprawl in a way that you can't when you're staying? Because oh, you also, sure. like, I don't, have you ever written first person where you're alternating perspectives? So I've done it one time and my editor said that's cheating. Don't ever do it again. So yeah, so I have done that before and I'm not allowed to anymore. <laughs> which which one was that? I can't remember. Ah, and you're asking me the complicated no, it's questions. Your book. Listen, I, know, I have ADHD a lot and a bad of books. memory. <laughs> Let me look. No, that's okay. Is. Why is that cheating though? It's 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 kind of I feel like, like I disagree. I... As a reader, I disagree. <laughs> I mean, I also, I mean, I kind of respect any version of writing in first person mm -hmm. as long as you're staying true. And also if you're going back and forth, you have to mark it very carefully so that people right. know whose perspective you're in. Because that's, that's the only thing that pisses me off too is, and you have to make sure that the voices are very different. Because mm -hmm. when I read a first person and it's flipping back and forth and it all sounds the same. That doesn't That's work for me. But for the ones where it's like such dramatically different voices, I'm mm -hmm. okay with that. It's even worse in audiobook. Uh yeah. When you have uh, and the the if you alternate mm -hmm. and you don't have distinction between the characters, it's impossible yep. to for people to follow. So I don't remember. I wish I did. I don't remember which book it is. I'm like it's, I, it's not recent. I though. File it away and move on. Yeah, it's not recent yeah okay it's not recent but ashley was like you need to push yourself more as a writer this is kind of a cop-out so not really a cop-out but it's just for me she wants me to do better at allowing the secondary or the the love interest to come through more with in first person and from that one pov mm -hmm. like and that's hard to do it really is yeah that's like the one complaint in all reviews is like i wish we would know more from you know brookside of the story or whatever mm -hmm. you know and i think a lot of people actually go back and write from write kind of the same story from the other perspective, from the love interest perspective. That's happening see, quite a bit. Yeah. So Eliza Lensky did it mm -hmm. with her winter jacket winter series. Jacket. And Elena Mackay has one now coming out soon. I actually am excited about this one because she's telling Magdalene Knox's mm -hmm. side of the story that she tells in the headmistress. And I think I think it makes sense just from like a, when you have a book that popular is so popular. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at that point, I don't know how to say this without sounding like I'm being cynical about it when I'm truly not. But to me, it's almost one of those like, well, that just prints money because right. it already has a built in fan base. Right. And it can be, it can still, it should still be able to function as a way into the story without having read the headmistress either. So it could, it could still be accessible to, other people so i think it's kind of cool it's not something that i would want to see on like every first person book right but, like for some of those really special ones and i also think it's especially interesting for ice queen stories in particular mm -hmm. when you're mm -hmm. getting the story from the perspective of the non-ice queen and there is this like oh just let me inside her brain yeah just for a little bit please <laughs> i might have to do like a short something for my patrons where i write brooke wellington's point of view when she meets cassie i might do something like that yes. i think just as a writing exercise and also to mm -hmm. to like really like i mean i wrote temptation a long time ago it's been out for a while but it was it is my most mm -hmm. successful book and everybody loves brooke wellington and the fact that that she's back and cherished for just a little bit you know she i mean i say a little bit mm -hmm. she's actually in it quite a bit but doesn't have a, a big storyline but yeah, I think people miss her and want her back. I want more of her. So that's oh, a good definitely. idea. I think I might have to give that to my patrons because they deserve Yay! it. Good job. Good job. You should. I can't think of that <laughs> book without thinking about like, it is the only book where I specifically remember where I was when I was listening to like a big chunk of it. I mm -hmm. think I told you this before, but I was at my company's conference in Palm <laughs> Springs 
I'm in kind of like my own hotel room. And then I was like, oh, we got to turn the volume down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't yes. know which client <laughs> or colleague <laughs> is in the next room. We're just going to turn it down a little bit. Well, I continue getting ready for bed. That's fine. <laughs> Yay. Mm -hmm. So that's a good idea. I like that. I'm going to have to do that. All right, everybody. You heard it here first. Get excited. Woohoo. You know what I've been doing, what I've been mm -hmm. reading and watching. What about you? What have you been reading and watching? Okay. So you haven't been getting a drag race update in a while. I actually yeah. have been watching a bunch of episodes of drag race down under. I think mostly I wasn't talking about it because it was like, well, is this even going to be good? I feel like I've mostly been bitching about drag race for the last couple of seasons that I've been watching. And I have to be honest, I'm really enjoying this season. Nice. I think it's a really interesting group of queens. Some of the guest judges they're having on has been hilarious. I think that of the three Australian seasons so far, this is probably the strongest batch of queens. Oh, like there is some just really clear, incredible talent that I hope we see a lot more of. And then I've been watching something and probably mentioned here and there that we have an outline that we sort of pull together so that we can stay on track for what we're going to talk about. And so Chris always knows what I'm going to talk about in this section, but there's one where all it says is surprise. And then in brackets, it says, Joe, you want to guess? what i've started oh, watching i see one episode joe 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 do i know a joe and all it's right. no tell me yeah because we could be here all night <laughs> after hearing you talk about it for two and a half years <gasps> i was finally inspired to start watching alone <gasps> <gasps> no yes <laughs> Yay. And the reason I wrote down the name Joe is because I don't know if you remember in the very first season, Joe is the young guy. He's 24. Mm -hmm. He I is from remember. like half an hour outside of my home. Oh, nice. I grew up in like a bedroom community for the city that, that he's from. So even just watching the show is humbling. I have to oh, say. Oh, for sure. Like, yeah. <laughs> You've talked like you've talked about like I would die, and I've been like, oh, a hundred percent, I would die too. And then I watched that episode, and I was like, oh, now I know the ways that I would die. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just you're gonna die yeah. right away, but mm. the ways you could die. Oh, for sure, I'm gonna I'm gonna die from nice. a bear. I'm so excited. I'm gonna die from. <laughs> you're gonna eat the bad berries. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna eat the bad berries. I like all the things. So this one is in British Columbia in canada mm -hmm. and like up kind of near the very top of vancouver island and it just looks miserable and mm -hmm. it's been super interesting to see kind of the attitudes that they have as they show up and how quickly the attitudes can <laughs> shift yes if you don't get food you get very miserable and very cranky yep. or if you're wet the whole time because you your mm -hmm. shelter is crap then yeah and that's the balance You're like what do you do do you do you spend your calories building this shelter or do you go like find oh. food i mean there's that's i know even like in in this episode i think only one of them managed to light a fire which means yeah. only one of them got to drink water Mm -hmm. But there was this one guy in particular that showed up. I think he's from Ohio. And he's like, I'm Ohio. not quitting for anything. I'm never going to. This, <laughs> this is going to be my. And he tapped out first. Yeah. He was the first one to go. Because he was mm -hmm. so sure until he realized, well, there's a fucking bear den in my area. And like, he's trying to sleep. And there's literally a bear outside of. Right. His, <laughs> his tarp. He set up. It's a tarp. <laughs> yeah, his tarp. And then he was just like. I have kids, like I have things to live for. And mm -hmm. so I'm going to go live with these things that I have to live for. Like, that's just not, this is right. not acceptable. And yeah, man, I should have jumped on this when you started talking to me about it two years ago, but I don't know that I would have <laughs> known how to find it. So if you are in Canada and definitely if you are in Calgary, like me, <laughs> I found it on the library so our library has a subscription to like, if you have a membership to our local library, you get access to Canopy, which is a, it's a, a digital platform for all kinds of shows. And it's on there. 
So oh, cool. you don't even need like a subscription that you pay for to watch it. Um, nice. And yeah, I was just like, whew, 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 holy shit. Yeah. And I also think there's something super interesting about like, it's very clear the footage they get. It's kind of that like that saying some parents say about like you get what you get and you don't get upset. Like there's no retakes. There's no director saying, we're Mm going to do this shot. We're going to do it here. Like they just work with whatever they get. And it's the storytelling that's through. Well, I guess this is what we got. We got a bunch of people's summer vacation videos and now not literally vacation, but like there is sort of that, like, okay, they got some training on how to use cameras, but Mm -hmm. now we're going to tell the story this way. Like they couldn't anticipate that there's definitely going to be a bear rustling on this guy's car. Oh yeah, for sure. How would they know? They don't know when it's going to rain, but this is the rain episode is I'm assuming going to be what's coming up. There's um, a lot of rain, a (laughs) lot of rain. And then it changes to snow and ice. So, I mean, these people, you know, they, they, I know that there are people out there who can survive this. Mm -hmm. I know that there are, but the people who apply, like Mm -hmm. they think they're better, they are better than they are. And it's kind of cool because, and they, they talk about like when, after that person has tapped out or whatever, they have to go in and do like just shots, like shots. Here's shots of the lake during this time. You know, they, mm. they have to do filler shots. Mm-hmm. So it is interesting to see how they have like a month. They train for a month before it even starts. That's yeah. cool. So they learn how to use all the cameras because they have like, like five giant totes of cameras and batteries and stuff because that's it. They set it up and it was oh funny God. because. The last season of Alone, not the mm-hmm. Australia one, but the one right before, there's a woman, or maybe it's on Australia, I don't remember, but there's a woman who forgot that her camera was set up, and she, like, gets out of her place, her her little tent, she comes out, or structure, or whatever she has, and she, mm-hmm. like, just pulls down her pants and goes to the bathroom, because she forgot. <laughs> she forgot and she's like and then she's going to the bathroom she's like oh my god yeah she's like oh my god i forgot the camera was on she goes well now you know <laughs> so i mean wow yeah yeah it's uh and it's interesting because you really do see their their journey their spiritual mm-hmm. like inside finding what their demons are or whatever you know that they when you're alone literally yeah. alone with your thoughts you go deep and so yeah, yeah. some of these people go really deep yeah, it's um well, yeah, it's it seems like a lot, but I'm very excited about it. And yeah, to... I'm excited too. We could talk and about now it. that I've told you, I can text you as I'm watching. I was saying to Neil the other day, I was like, I'm so torn because I so desperately want to text Chris <laughs> while I'm watching this. But yeah. maybe I should just surprise her as a recording. He's like, Yeah. Surprise Massive her. surprise. I'm <laughs> so, so excited. Yes. Mm, yes. So yes. get ready for some stoned texting because that's what it's gonna be <laughs> i'm ready <laughs> yeah as if i don't already text you when i'm still <laughs> but now it's gonna be specific to this show and then the other thing is Yay. so i've been listening to a non-fiction book and i'm torn because it could technically be an official recommendation mm-hmm. so maybe i should kick myself later when i'm like oh no what am i going to recommend But I'm going to cheat and I'm going to recommend here and have an official recommendation. So it's called You Just Need to Lose Weight and 19 Other Myths About Fat People by Aubrey Gordon. Aubrey Gordon, I've talked about uh, in a couple different contexts in the past. She wrote another book to do with fatness, but she is also co-host of my personal favorite podcast of all time, Maintenance Phase, which... I don't know if you remember me talking about it, but it's the one. Yeah. So for people Mm -hmm. that don't know, maintenance phase is really Aubrey Gordon, who she describes herself as a fat lady about town in a lot of the episodes. She used to write the Your Fat Friend column for for Elle. There's actually a documentary coming out about her that I can't fucking wait. Mm. But I think it has to do like the indie film circuit first, probably. And then Michael Hobbs, he's an investigative journalist. He used to work for HuffPo. He was on the You're Wrong About. So they do this and they're just like debunking wellness stuff all the time. Oh, good. Uh, which yeah, that's cool. I've found tremendously helpful because they do they do a ton of research and they talk to other researchers. They read books, they conduct interviews, they do this. And then it all comes to bear on what they're saying. And it's been so good for unraveling a lot of the bullshit that I've learned because there is so much around wellness that's bullshit. And this book is actually kind of in that spirit too, but really specifically about fatness. Each chapter is a different myth And there's like groups of them. So part one is Mm -hmm. about the idea of being fat as a choice. 
the fat people don't like how they're treated, they should just lose weight. And like, it doesn't work like that, right? You can't right. as much as everybody's trying to lose weight, but how come nobody, almost nobody is able to keep it off. And it's wild how the science even bears it out. Most people who try to lose weight will end up regaining weight. And we don't right. fully understand all the reasons, but what we do know is that fewer than 5% and sometimes even 2% of people are able to keep weight off. And then it also has wow. things like, you know, calories in, calories out doesn't really work. Parents are responsible for their child's weight. Only bad parents let their children get fat. That's the chapter where I was horrified oh. learning that like, there are kids oh. who are taken, fat kids who are taken away from very good, stable, happy homes, you know, loving families. I would like yeah. to add something. Do it. That this documentary that I'm going to discuss next actually mm -hmm. talks about a mother who would tie her children to the bumper of the car <gasps> to make them get exercise. That is horrifying. That is. It is. Like, I just, I'm actually stunned. Yeah. Hearing, and you know, it, like, it is rare <laughs> that I'm a at lot. a loss right. for words. Right. I actually felt something like in my gut. There was this, like, when you said that, there was something in my whole body that just stopped yeah and oh and i wasn't oh. even gonna bring it up i wasn't even gonna make that yeah, part yeah. of the conversation because it's such a small part of it but it's such a yeah. big thing you know but talking about it with you oh yeah i feel like yeah and parents and and having children that are overweight like what that means and and mm -hmm. how they take it yeah, yeah. it's not good no. at all so mm -hmm. then part two is about like well what about your health you know, there are people that still think the BMI is an objective measure of size and health when like it was never, ever, ever, ever created for that. It was based specifically on white men mm -hmm. in Europe. Mm -hmm. The idea that like the next part is about like fat acceptance glorifies obesity. And there's like different chapters about that. That really gets into the fact that like if you're literally just a fat person living your life, but you happen to be famous then there's this bullshit like Piers Morgan saying that Lizzo is glorifying oh, obesity. And it's like, first of all, fuck you, Piers Morgan. You're not perfect body either. And it's like, is Lizzo supposed to just not work because right. she's fat? Like, <laughs> is being a fat person who lives glorifying obesity? Like, you have to just, you have to live in the body you have. And then the right. last chapter is around the idea of like fat people should. And so like, there's one actually I think was super interesting. There's this myth that fat people shouldn't call themselves fat. And so she talks about how like for her, it's a neutral term. It's only not a neutral term. If you think fat quote unquote means other things like that, you know, a lot of the stereotypes around like lazy and not taking care of yourself and all of that, all of which is just total bullshit. This is actually a book that I think everybody should read. The author is queer, like Aubrey Gordon is queer. I think the main reason I ultimately opted not to make it an official recommendation is, A, I was too excited to wait. <laughs> I'm impatient. <laughs> but also, typically when we choose our official recommendations, it's usually like, a topic that's about queerness like she does talk about how like it can impede you know like being perceived as extremely fat can impede say trans people from getting gender affirming surgeries but like mm -hmm. for the most part like it's really about fatness in general it's not about queer fatness specifically or anything like that but like so so good such an important book unfortunately i don't think enough people are going to read it but if you can possibly like it just she brings so much evidence she goes to the science and i think that's one of the things that I really appreciate and reveals how so much of the way we talk about fatness really comes down to moral panic mm. and the influences of pharmaceutical companies. Because even just as one example, all of a sudden, there were millions of Americans who were not classified as obese that were because I think it was Abbott and Roche two pharmaceutical companies lobbied the World Health Organization to change the BMI statuses because they wanted to release uh, weight loss drugs. Oh, geez. Yeah. Onto the market. Is there actually an obesity epidemic or did it get manufactured in service of weight loss drugs, weight loss programs, all of that? Like it was also Jenny Craig, Weight Watchers, all oh, of those yeah. were also part of pushing it. I think it's really important for all of us to understand that 
we've kind of been sold a lie. And so we pursue things, you know, we think we're trying to get healthier by losing weight, but actually a lot of what we're doing is damaging our health. Hmm. When, if we try to do the things to make us healthier, like work out because it makes your body feel good, work out because it makes you feel strong, eat better because you feel better when you eat better, rather than pursuing a number that you're probably not going to achieve, but you're going to keep trying to achieve, which is only going to benefit these companies. Right. It all turns back to fuck companies, doesn't it? (laughs) I always <laughs> end up back there. <laughs> That's good, though. Yeah. All right, Chris. Yes. What is your official recommendation this week? Okay, so like we talked earlier, you know, we're going through document documentaries, and I thought, let's stay with the musicians. And I found a documentary called Wish Me Away by Shelley Wright. For those who don't know who Shelley Wright is, she is a country musician. I do not listen to country, but she's from my hometown, and I feel like I missed out on a possible friend. She's from Wellsville, Kansas, which is about 20 miles outside of Kansas City. And I remember when she came out, and I think it was in 2010 when she came out, I remember the controversy because she was the first openly gay country music singer. And the Midwest and the country fans fell apart. Like, I I ended up, I bought her book. Like I said, I don't. I didn't know who she was. I didn't know anything about her until this book came out. And this book is called Like Me. And I wanted to read it because, A, you know, like I said, she grew up here in Kansas City or around Mm -hmm. this area. This is where she went to, you know, be social or whatever. And I just wanted to know her story. Also, I'm sad that our paths never crossed until they did. But I digress. Yes, we'll talk (gasps) about that. (laughs) So I found out that she spent three years preparing for her coming out for her professional Mm -hmm. and personal coming out story so she drops this book she drops her album that uh, i think it was called lifted off the ground Mm -hmm. and 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 that was a bunch of songs written about the trauma of being gay and closeted and not Mm -hmm. and living life's you know just having life experiences living that way so Mm -hmm. all of her songs are very emotional very raw and then this documentary came out like Right after she did, literally. She documented her coming out process. And, you know, I know that we've been on TikTok and you've seen people who are like, this is my voice, 10 days on T and Mm -hmm. they continue with their journey. Or people who are like 30 days until I meet my TikTok crush. And then at the, the, there's, or I like forgot what song Dil- it is. Dylan Mulvaney's Days of Girlhood or. Right, exactly. So, yeah. so like a count, almost like a countdown. And then, you know, like 20 days until I married crush, 10 days, you know, 24 mm. hours, two days, you know, two hours. And so listen up, Gen Zers, like Shelly Wright did it first. Maybe not first, <laughs> but she did it a long time ago. So she, mm-hmm. she did this whole process, like her whole entire life. I feel like if TikTok was big in 1989, she would have a bajillion followers by now because yes. like she actually recorded and it was so interesting because she starts off the documentary and she's like, it's May 12th, 1989, my birthday, thank you. And I'm on my way to Nashville. Mm. So by 1995, she was like, or 19, yeah, 1995, she was the top new country musician of the year. She sang on a uh, stage at the Grand Old Opry, which apparently mm-hmm. is the cat's meow and country talk. Well, yeah, um, that's the, I mean, okay, here's the thing. I'm a Canadian. And you know that. And I don't listen to country, <laughs> but I know that, well, it's one of those, it's a milestone for country artists because that's where all their favorites, that's where all the legends have performed and sometimes continue to perform. Yeah. I, yeah, nothing. Nope. All like right. My, da- my parents, wa- I think my dad, my dad was really into country and they would watch shows and I would just mm. walk in and go, oh, oh and we'll, and leave you know i'd walk yeah. in the house see it on tv and then go upstairs and watch my own tv you know whatever uh, it just wasn't yeah. my thing I, i'm yeah. just not into country music no um you know Same. and 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 so this was such a good documentary because like i said she had all the videos from you know as as early as 1989 when she started wow. recording this and it was just it was just so it was so raw 
And she mm-hmm. would tell like the she would tell the camera like I, I can't believe I'm doing this I'm gonna you know this could destroy me I'll, you know and this it's so very in the moment you know mm-hmm. and this is like just like the handheld video recorders that you turned around on yourself it wasn't like the phones that you could see you know it wasn't like that yeah. it was old school you know she was in the closet for so many years and she dated men just to kind of cover up her queerness and mm-hmm. she was so private that even her manager didn't know she was gay. Wow. Like, and your manager knows everything about you had no clue like that's how in the closet she was did she have any friends or family who knew she said eventually she, like her aunt yeah. she told her aunt her dad knew and her dad and her mom divorced i don't know at what point they divorced i think it was after she got successful mm-hmm. um again why am i watching documentaries where the mothers are horrible you know, and, and that was one thing she wanted to, to get across was that she loved her mom, you know, her mom Mm -hmm. made mistakes. She loved her mom, you know, Mm -hmm. regardless of all the stuff that, that her mom did. But anyway, so she really wanted to focus on, on the queer lifestyle. She was, she was living, not living, you know, and Mm -hmm. she, it was just eating her up inside. Like, that's how it is, especially when you're in the limelight people, why aren't you dating? You know, it's kind of like with George Michael, why, why are you, you know, why aren't you married? Who are you dating? Yeah. You know, and, and it's just so uncomfortable. Like people assume you're heterosexual and just ask you, Hey, like, mm-hmm. who's your boyfriend or whatever. And that was the situation with her. And she said that not living openly gay almost killed her. You know, she yeah. was suicidal. You know, people said country music would not accept a queer person. Mm-hmm. And so she kind of disappeared. I think like, I think maybe 2005 or so, she just kind of disappeared because she had to deal with all of this and figure out what she was going to do with her life. And she had to come out like that was her thing. She had to come out to be her authentic self. And of course, you know, after she came out, she wasn't invited to do any country music events. No. Uh, Yeah. So so... you're reminding me of (gasps) two different Christian musicians. Now, one Mm. of them is not gay, but you're kind of reminding me of what happened when Amy Grant. Yes. I was just going to say that. Right. The way the Christian music community turned on Amy Grant because she got a divorce and they were also all up in arms again this year because she said she would host her niece's lesbian wedding. Right. I remember that. Yeah. So there's one other, she was, when I was still like deeply, deeply Christian, One of my absolute favorite singers was Jennifer Knapp. If you look her up, I actually think you'd really love her voice. It was so gorgeous. K-N-A-P-P is how her last name is spelled. Okay. And then she just kind of like disappeared. And I was like, where'd she go? And then I'm trying to remember when she resurfaced and if I was still in the church or not. It was long enough ago that I'm kind of hazy on that Mm -hmm. detail. So it was like within the last decade. And she said... The reason I disappeared is because I came to understand that I was a lesbian and I couldn't keep doing this, but now I'm back and I'm going to do this authentically. And it was like such a mind fuck, to be honest. But now it's like, well, how amazing, how amazing to thrive kind of in her own way. But that the way you were saying, like with Shelly Wright, just saying like, I can't be a public figure and be closeted it's especially in country music i mean yes like you couldn't ask for a more conservative music well i mean christian rock except for the, except for the christian <laughs> except music for that <laughs> so that kind of goes christian There's a rock, lot of overlap and, uh, country yeah yeah <laughs> that's true that's true the good news is is um like after all this happened she packed up left nashville and moved to new york of course and you know everybody good new york is super blue and super queer and and wonderful and yeah so let's talk about my connection Let's see, Yay! I Let's saw your, your face when I talked about it. Okay, so besides being a famous person from Kansas City, Shelley Wright started the Like Me organization. And it, it's like first mission was to, to go out and talk to, to schools and colleges, corporations for the need to have the need uh, for equality, LGBTQ equality, mm-hmm. and against LGBTQ bullying, which we know mm-hmm. is a serious issue. So and that is like her her whole organization. And so she started the Like Me Lighthouse here in Kansas City uh, back in 2010. Like when all this, when she, like literally when she came out, she fucking came out in a blaze of glory. I mean, Mm -hmm. she just, everything came out. And it was there for for young queers, teens, adults, anybody who really needed a safe space. She she helped create this. 
And I went there to check it out back in like 2016. Yeah. Um, one of my friends kind of you know, like is was involved in it at the time. I don't know if she still is or not. So in like in 2016, I did a shout out, like I did a, a call, all call. I don't even know what to call it. I said on social media, I'm like, hey, we need books for the library here in Kansas City. So if you have any queer books or magazines that you want to get rid of or you would like to add to the library here, you know, please send them. And so I got mm-hmm. a ton. I got a ton. It was great. Like everybody was just so generous with their stuff. So mm-hmm. I got a lot of donations. So I did a um I, I did a shout out to to Shelly on social media. And I said, here's the loot I'm dropping off. You know, thanks for creating a space for us. And mm-hmm. she was super sweet and kind of thanked me. And so here's the here's the shitty part about this. So like the local place, you know, this lighthouse place, yeah. which is no longer called the lighthouse. We'll get into that too. But they mm-hmm. got mad at me for tagging her, for communicating with her. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, why, why would you not want to share this information with somebody who helped build this? Yeah. So I'm just like, that doesn't even make sense. So, um, no. yeah. Weird. So, yeah. So, she, so like I said, she did this for us and I did this for us. So whatever. Yes. Um. So now the lighthouse is called the Kansas City Center for Inclusion. And really, it sucks. I'm not going to lie. Mm. Like, it is open on Fridays. Fridays from two to seven. That's it. That's the only time you can go and say, I need to talk to people. I want to be around people like me. Mm-hmm. That's the only time it's open from two to 7 PM on Fridays. Like they have a calendar of events, but it's not a lot. It's like every thir- every other Thursday they have this and every other Tuesday they have this. Mm-hmm. And it's the board is like 10 members. They have 10 board members. And that like, seems like a lot, right? So, and they have like some volunteers and stuff, but the the place, the actual place is mm-hmm. only open two to seven. Now I know they moved locations from when I was there. So mm-hmm. I don't know if it's just like a room now or whatever. I don't know that's what sad. the problem is, but yeah, like everything in Kansas city that's queer is disappearing. And mm-hmm. that makes, you know, and, and uh, I have, I have feelings about this. So well, yeah, anyway. So to sum things up, Kansas City and neighboring towns like Lawrence, they have squeezed out some pretty cool musicians and writers. I'll go ahead and give myself a shout out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think if you like learning about, you know, people, famous people coming out, you know, and their struggles and and how they thrive since, this is definitely a documentary that you want to watch. That sounds really good. It it is. It was really good. And like I said, I was super surprised that the film, the footage mm-hmm. that she had, that she took herself. I mean, all this, like when she came out to her aunt, she interviewed her aunt and, you know, there was a lot of tears, a lot of rawness. And even when she was doing the book deal, her editor, like she would record, uh, Shelly would record the, like the editing process and, mm-hmm. and she would get like really mad. And this is something that's true. So Shelly Wright is like, her editor didn't understand her where she came from. Like, why can't you just say this? Because Shelly grew up in the freaking Midwest, the Bible belt of the United States. And it's so different if you're living from New York and you have that experience. And same thing with my editor, you know, who lives in California. Mm -hmm. Like people don't know what it's like in the Midwest and how it's not queer friendly and hasn't been like ever. So yeah. it is a struggle and people don't understand that. And it's just not easy. It's, it's not. And so she does, she has a, like a total breakdown against her editor, very angry about her because her editor also wanted to put more stuff in about her mom and she didn't really want to. And so oh, that's not cool. Yeah. So, but it was, it, it other than, you know, it was just, it was very emotional, Um, mm-hmm. you know, and like I said, she's, she's, you know, kind of like my, my city sister. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I wanted to see the happy ending and she got it. Good. Yeah. That's so, amazing. Yeah. So uh, we'll see what other cool music documentaries I can find for the next <laughs> episode because I seem to be on a roll. Yes. But- this is our music. Do- I, it's not just our documentary era. It's our music documentary era. Right. <laughs> Pretty specifically. <laughs> yeah. So that is my recommendation. What is your official recommendation this week? So do you remember how last episode you recommended Wham, the documentary about the group Wham? And you said, you know, I really wish there was something about George Michael's future career. (laughs) Good news. There is. It's another documentary and it's called Freedom (laughs) Uncut. 
um, <laughs> because it really does kind of pick up from there. So I was talking to another nice. friend. He's a huge, huge, huge music fan, much a much bigger music geek than I am. And he was talking about this particular one and how it was really, really good. And, you know, it's kind of heartbreaking. And George Michael was just such a sensitive soul. Like he's really kind of hooked by sensitive souls. Like Michael Hutchins from In Excess is another one like that. And that documentary really got to him. I haven't seen it yet. But uh, I said, oh, cool. My, you know, my friend just recommended the Wham! documentary on the podcast. Do I need to watch that one first? And he's like, yeah, you really should. And so I did. Um, and I'm glad that I did because of the way it goes from like, it's almost seamless. Oh, really? Um, yeah. So there's like five minutes about Wham at the beginning. And then it really gets the rest of it is about his solo solo career. This is about a solo career. So George Michael had been he had actually been part of producing this documentary freedom there's been other Mm. documentaries about him there was one that he did uh there was one about him in 2005 that he participated in but he was working on this one as kind of an update and it was meant to be released in 2017 and it it did actually it was released that year in the uk on television he died in 2016 so it was like they they did most of what they wanted to do and put that out there but last year there was an extended version that was released and that's what i watched Hmm. so the extended version is called freedom uncut i think what was released in 2017 is just called freedom so this is not a documentary about his life it's really about his career Hmm. as a solo artist it does bring his life in but it comes in as it relates to the music career So we don't really hear about his childhood. I think the thing that was interesting for me is that I, when I think of George Michael, I think of like a highly specific era. And that was his era with the album Faith, which I mean, it was was amazing. Yeah. Huge, right? Like Mm -hmm. it was everywhere. And I, I mean, I was a little kid when that album came out, I was in grade school. And so when I think of George Michael, I think about him in like the jeans with the motorcycle jacket and the big sunglasses. Like, yes, he always wore sunglasses, but not like those in the way they reflect and the, <laughs> and that hair. And the, like, that was just kind of what I always thought of. And I always thought of him as the same as like, he's like Prince and Madonna and Michael Jackson. And he was to a certain extent, especially kind of that one year with Faith where he was the biggest selling artist bar none that was just how it was and so i think i appreciated getting to see the rest of his story because i i mean i heard some of the big highlights of course i heard about you know when he was arrested and that sort of sting operation that led to him being outed and then kind of some of the other when he got arrested for cruising in Hampstead park like all those things that made it to the news but i missed so much much of the rest of it and so you know of the things that I learned like I had no idea that after faith he said I'm not doing promo for albums anymore (laughs) like I can't I'm not doing it I I can't do it it's kind of hard for me to keep this and the Wham documentary separate because they run sort of so seamlessly together but like with Wham we see that you know he and Andrew Ridgely did this thing And it was really like without Andrew Ridgely, he never would have become famous because like he needed his friend to prod him into like, let's we're going to join a band. We're going to do this thing. But it was clear that like he's the better songwriter. He's the better singer. He's kind of the better everything. And there's a point at which it's like it was almost like Wham was created to launch him as a solo solo artist. Mm -hmm. And like we know that that's not actually what it was created for, but that is what it ended up doing. Right. And seeing that he had this drive for perfection and perfection for him was, I need to be at the top. I need to be number one. I need to sell the most. I need to do the most. And there was a point with Faith where he was like, wait, I'm doing this alone. I used to be able, because yeah, they would Mm -hmm. go out and like, he was, he was sleeping with the women too, when they were in Wham. And it was this, like, at least he had a friend to kind of decompress with. And then Mm -hmm. they would both go out and party. And then, and now he's doing it alone and it was too much. And he realized that it was hurting him. And so he pulled a move that like, I don't think any artist had done that before, especially at that level to say, here's your album. 
I refuse to promote it. I'm not doing interviews. I'm not doing concerts. I'm not doing anything. And even when I think about now, like how many artists have done that? Like Beyonce doesn't do interviews, but she's still touring right now. Right. George Michael wasn't touring. Like he wasn't doing anything. I didn't know anything about like the big, he had like three big romantic relationships in his life. Only one of them is really comes kind of into play in this documentary because it dramatically impacts his music. Did you ever hear about his relationship with Anselmo? I did not and have not. Or if I did, I'd forgotten. You know, it's one of those where once we found out, you know, when he came yeah. out, you know, then, then things, came, you know, but that was such a long time ago. I have slept yeah. many nights since then. So when he was 27 or 28, he, this was kind of still in his no promo era, but he really wanted to go to Brazil, I guess. And was like, so I'm going to go do a concert in Rio so that I can go get to hang out uh, in Brazil with my friends. And he talked about how he was doing this concert and he sees this really cute guy kind of towards one end of the stage. And he actually stops going towards that end of the stage. At one point he was like, I, I he was afraid he was going to forget the lyrics because this guy was so handsome. Wow. I'm and looking him up. This is the first, he was his first partner and the, I know you love words. I know you mm -hmm. love words. So I actually brought I a quote. Them. I never hey. bring quotes. I brought a quote and it was an interview that he did with, he, he references, he says this in the documentary, but it was also, you can find it in an interview that he did exclusively for the Huffington Post in 2009, where he says, it's very hard to be proud of your sexuality when it hasn't given you any joy. But once you've found somebody you really love, it's not so tough which I thought was just so beautiful. And, you know, he had kind of, he had slept with some guys before, but this was the first time he was in a romantic relationship that he really loved somebody. And six months in, Anselmo was diagnosed with HIV. Mm. By the way, he's adorable. I just looked him up. Right? Isn't he beautiful? <laughs> he really is. Like, they're so cute together. And so what was kind of an interesting experience for me, so I watched, so we're recording this on a Sunday. I watched Wham! yesterday in the morning, and then I was like, oh, I didn't know that he performed Somebody to Love, because I was reading some of the, like, Andrew Ridgely mm -hmm. interviews, and I found an interview, I think, with The Guardian, where it was asking, like, what do you think are some of George Michael's best performances? And he was like, well, it's really hard to choose, but there are certain ones that show that he is, like, unparalleled, and one of them is when he performed at the Freddie Mercury tribute mm -hmm. concert. And so I went and I watched that video and I was like, holy shit, that is good. Like, and truly, like, it's just such a spectacular performance because he's, in my opinion, because he's not trying to do Freddie Mercury. It is George Michael singing Freddie Mercury's mm. song with like as much George Michael as possible. Well, then when I watched this documentary, it recontextualized the whole thing because at that point they knew that his partner had HIV. Mm -hmm. And so for him, it was so heartbreaking oh, because he's yeah. performing because his idol, like his childhood idol died of the same disease that he knows is going to kill his partner. Mm. And it was just one of those like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're crying again now. Okay. <laughs> but even hearing like he wanted it so perfect that he practiced for five days. Nobody else at that concert practiced that much. And it's so it's so good it's so beautiful mm, but that's so up. oh oh you're gonna get chills you're gonna love it i know it's... i got chills in every other song that they played during the wham documentary it was like oh i love that oh song. yeah oh i love that song well there is from his second solo album the one that freedom 90 is mm, on mm -hmm. there were a couple that's songs so i had never heard before and what was really cool so in this in this particular documentary they had a bunch of other music artists and like really famous ones. And they had turntables there for them to play certain songs of his. And there was one, I had never heard it before. And I burst into tears. And oh. it's like, you know, every so often you just hear a song and there's something yeah. about it. You can't help it. The last time I remember it happening was a cover of nothing compares to you by Jimmy Scott, which if you haven't heard, like anybody go find it on Spotify. It was so haunting and gorgeous. I immediately burst into tears. And that happened with a couple of his songs from that um, mm. from that particular album. And I was like, what am I, a baby? And then one of them is like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm crying right now. And I was like, aha, this famous musician is crying. It's not just me. <laughs> That's just like some people get to you. And so it also talks about how 
he came out to his parents by letter. He wrote a letter the day after oh, wow. M. Salmo died because he just he he couldn't keep it in anymore. And it was really sweet to hear about his mother's reaction, who just like loved him so much and said, like, the thing that was the most heartbreaking was to know that he went through all of that alone alone yeah and mm. so i went and kind of like read some other articles and stuff and he said that the main reason he hadn't come out for so long especially knowing that he was sort of like like he aids was so big he didn't want his mom to panic mm -hmm. and then you know a few years after Anselmo dies his mom passed away and his mom had really sort of become everything to him and that was really the beginning of you know he had very very dark periods he had deep depression there was drug use there was like some pretty rough drug use and so I think he he sort of had demons for the rest of his life. He had mm. a couple of long-term relationships. They don't show up in this. He was in a relationship for 13 years. And then after that, for four more years until he he died, he was with that last partner. But it really sounded like, you know, this man he met in Brazil was the love of his life. Like, mm. yes, he had meaningful relationships. But, you know, I kind of wonder if it's one of those, they were only together for two years. You know, he got his diagnosis when they were together for six months. And so it's like that period where you're still so passionate and the bullshit mm -hmm. hasn't really come in yet. And so it's quite easy to see it as that purest love. It's not hard yet. And so to lose it at that point, like, I think it's just sounded like one of those things that he carried for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like what I found really interestingly, that's the wrong word, interesting. What I found really interesting about it. First of all, it's just how it's constructed, because we've been talking a little bit about music documentary construction. Actually, you mm -hmm. specifically have been talking about it because I couldn't help watching it and not thinking about how this was constructed versus how Wham! was done versus how Nothing Compares was done, mm, the right. documentary about Sinead O'Connor. Because with that one, Sinead O'Connor was interviewed for it, but we didn't see her talking kind of in the present day ever. Right. And they had quite a bit of archival footage we saw her talking in archival footage but they also like i think they had actors that were kind of like doing acting out some of the scenes for hers as she was talking over it to sort of like give you something to look at so just as an example like when she was talking about speaking of bad mothers in documentaries right talking about when her mother made her live in the garden for a week or two mm -hmm. and she's like mm -hmm. seven or eight years old and they have oh, like that that's little right. girl and yeah. it's stylized but she's talking about it so i get it like if you're not going to show her talking you have to show something while she's talking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then with the wham one you were talking about how you know they only have the voices of george michael and andrew ridgely but they never show them so what is up with that? Well, I looked it up and I found out what was up with that. Ooh, what? <laughs> <laughs> so what happened was Andrew Ridgely wrote a book that came out in 2019 about Wham and his kind of relationship with George Michael and all mm. of this. And he thought to promote it, maybe like, let's do a little short film that we can put on TV or something like that. And I guess he brought it to somebody who was like, no, this is too big a deal. Let's turn it into a documentary mm. um, on Netflix. And so my thing too was like, how did they get all this detail for George Michael? When did this thing start? Well, there was an interview he did at one point that was about three hours long that went deep into his whole everything. And so they were able to use that. But oh. what they needed to do was like, Andrew Ridgely would have to work around what they had between that interview and archival footage and they kind of came to a conclusion together that if we can't show george michael talking like saying these things because it was just an audio interview oh, mm -hmm. well then he wouldn't either so that they were existing kind uh. of on the same plane was the way it was described and i was like that's actually that's, it's cool right it is it is very very cool like i think it works it actually makes it a more effective documentary overall than it would have been if it was only George Michael's voice, but then we see Andrew Ridgely's face. So yeah. we have like one man of indeterminate age and one man in his 60s. Right. <laughs> because you're looking at his face. Now, yeah. when it comes to this one, there's a lit like we do see him in the present day a little bit but it's almost more for those it's like him at a typewriter and he'll type out like a word or a phrase and then they'll talk about that and so mm -hmm. it is like his voice kind of recorded over some things but also kind of 
they did a tiny bit of this in Nothing Compares when they brought in Kathleen Hanna, who, of course, was the front woman for Bikini Kill, and mm -hmm. the other one, La Tigra. And then I think they brought they brought in Peaches, but they had tons of famous people in this one. Wow. They had one of the Gallagher brothers from Oasis. They had Mark Ronson, Stevie Wonder, Elton John. Yeah, um, Elton really loved him. Oh, yes, absolutely. They had Mary J. Blige, who he did a duet oh. with, a really spectacular duet. Oh, yeah, that's duet. right. Yes. Yes, I forgot about that. They had <gasps> Clive Davis. And what was interesting is they had Clive Davis there sort of in, it. I don't want to say it was in two capacities. He was sort of there mostly in the capacity of, yeah, he recorded with two of my best artists because he did duets with Aretha Franklin and Whitney mm -hmm, Houston, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But also at one point, he's the CEO of Sony. Or I think he's the CEO of Sony now, maybe. And I'll get into this in a little bit, but he, it also talks about like the lawsuit he had against Sony, who was his label for a while. And so it was really cool getting to see all of these people talk about him and their impact. Oh, and also all the supermodels, because I don't think I ever saw the video for Freedom <gasps> in 90. That's an amazing video which i need to go back and yes. watch yes yes you do <laughs> here's a fun fact about me okay. when i was in high school i was fascinated by the supermodels and like that was and it was like all the ones that were in his video mm -hmm. because my mom now this is where i would love to know why did she do this was it because she was afraid i wasn't feminine enough i don't know but she signed me up for a flare subscription Flair was kind of like Canada's Vogue, never as big, never as impactful, but it was oh. like the fashion magazine of Canada, <laughs> which like, so I was equally obsessed with Nirvana and Linda Evangelista, which of course now as an adult who recognizes my own queerness, I can say, well, I just really had a really big fucking crush on Linda Evangelista, <laughs> who was gorgeous. <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> She's not going to listen to this. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, you're safe. <laughs> Yeah, it's sick. So seeing that, and it was the, it was so cool. Also, again, watching this now, because it was the five supermodels that were on that like brain breaking Vogue UK cover that happened in the 90s. So Naomi Campbell, mm -hmm. Linda Evangelista, Christy Turlington. Oh, no. So did you, My have you seen out. it Naomi then? Did you actually watch the video or you have not? Or you have? They, they show they show clips of it. Clips. Um, ah, that's And it. it's so cool. And like the symbolism of it with like that leather jacket burning at the end. Because he said he wasn't going to do any promo. And that meant not even doing his own music videos. And it was so, so, so cool mm -hmm. to see, you know, Elton John saying he changed the game. He changed mm -hmm. the game with that because... You would never not have an artist in your right. own video, but to have like these supermodels talking about this. And also, I don't know if you know this, but they just, it's been the 25th anniversary of that cover. And so because that cover was so huge, he was like, it needs to be them. They need to be the ones to do this. And so Naomi Campbell talks about how he found her in LA and he's like, you're kind of the leader of this group. You need to bring the other ones in because if you're not in, they won't be in. And like it happened and it was a moment I had just watched kind of like the reunion video where they're interviewing each other on YouTube recently. Mm. And they were all there except Tatiana. I can't remember her last name who unfortunately passed away mm. earlier this year of breast cancer. And so for me, it was just like total coincidence, but also so cool when things collide. So cool. So yeah, it gets into also his, um, he took Sony to court and it sounds like part of it might've been just, he needed to figure out something to do while he was grieving. Cause he wasn't doing music at that point, but also this idea that like, I don't think I even realized or thought of it that way. His thing was he wanted out of his contract. It also like, it's not fair that when you're in a contract, you can't actually quit your job. Yeah. As a musician, you can't quit your job in the way that like, I can quit my job. Right. Just quit walk out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can't do that. And I don't think it's fair also for people to say, well, you wanted to be famous, so deal with it. It's like everybody should be able to leave something right. that isn't serving them. 
And then finally, the other thing that I thought was super, well, no, okay. I have two other things I thought was interesting. So we <laughs> talked about who was in it. Something else I thought was interesting was who was not in it. So like, I think it's totally fine that none of his family was in it. Cause like, it's about his career. They weren't contributors to his career, but Andrew Ridgely was not in it. Like he wasn't interviewed. He's referenced. Oh, but oh. he wasn't interviewed. And so there's a part of me that's like, what's up with that? Cause like he didn't work after wham, he did one album that didn't really do anything. And I was talking to Neil about it. And he did point out that part of the problem with, with documentaries sometimes is that there are people that are not there because, you know, for a number of reasons, maybe the schedules don't line up. So yeah, like maybe oh, yeah. the schedule didn't line up or whatever, but um, so I thought that was an interesting omission. And also there was a part of me that was like, mm, where was Madonna or where was, oh. where was Prince? Prince died the same year as him. And like, maybe they weren't friends and maybe it wasn't interesting. I don't know, but I don't know for somebody kind of, I just thought maybe somebody like that would show up. I am not saying that, you know, Stevie Wonder and Elton John are not good enough. They're definitely good. <laughs> <laughs> Second rate musicians. <laughs> right. I think my favorite line in terms of like hilarious lines, I think the most hilarious line in the whole thing is Elton John talking about when they get to kind of the opening of Freedom 90 and how iconic it is. And when it gets to the piano part and he says that the effect of, and it wasn't me doing that. I always hated him a little bit for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're on to something when Elton John is mad at you. The, right. Okay. So the final thing that I thought was very interesting is that when he talks about coming out and his mom's reaction to it, he does not mention his dad at all. Mm. His dad gets little to no mention for anything in this. Although... If you watch the Wham documentary, mm -hmm. and I actually, I went back to that section because I was like, did he talk about his dad being such a shithead when he wanted to get started in music? Because his dad was like, you shouldn't do it. You should get a normal job. You can't sing anyway. You have a bad voice. Because like, I was prepared to get like really kind of offended on his behalf that Andrew Ridgely is like airing his family's dirty laundry. And it's right. like, no, <laughs> it was, he, was, he was actually the one who said it. Okay. He was the one who said it. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> but it's just like. It's really, it's really great. I think it's one of those, like, if you loved him, if you're curious, know more about him, or if you just love music documentaries, it really is a must see. And it is, I think my friend was ultimately right. It's a very sad story of someone who just like, he was so driven. He so had this like ego that had to be fed and feeding it was also hurting him at the same time and it just sounds like he he only had a short period of peace yeah and i think that's really sad but what he left the world with his legacy is so right. beautiful right it's so I mean, good after i watched the documentary i was playing freedom 90 i was like alexa mm -hmm. play freedom 90 and oh. it's just because i just you know, it's, it's nostalgic for me, you know, just his music yeah. and, and like, it was fascinating back then. It's, it's so cool to see how music has evolved. Like yes. I said, the eighties, best decade ever, whatever. Yes. Um, how music has evolved so much and like the people who make it, you know, the big wigs yeah. and, and what their music's about and how they came about to be just so popular and so famous and why, and, mm -hmm. and these people deserve it. I mean, Oh, they are well, 24 seven. A lot of musicians, people think, oh, they're just mm -hmm. partiers and they're, you know, getting stoned or drunk yeah. or whatever every night and stuff. But the whole ladder to success for musicians, it's very hard to be successful. Yes, And, you know, and they, they got there. So let them do what they want. You know, something I thought was really funny. So did you see the song that he made kind of as a response to that sting operation and him being outed um what was it called i can't remember but what i do know is that it involves like I male this... police officers making out with each other in the video which i think yes. is hilarious and the biggest <laughs> middle fingers the other thing my friend pointed to because they don't show any of it in the documentary is do you know who graham norton is he has a tv show in the uk where he interviews people 
I think so. Didn't he interview? Well, shit, I got to look him up. Hold on. He's interviewed like most people, but he's gay and he has this, it's typically like a panel show, but he interviewed him kind of after, at some point after that, when George Michael was out and he was talking to him about it a little bit. And I think one of the things that's great about that interview is he sort of gets to the whole like, and you were just like back out for the dinner the next day. And he's like, yeah, I mean, I'm gay. Like, I'm not embarrassed about it. Like, maybe I shouldn't have gone about that particular gone about it in that kind of a particular way mm-hmm. i'd gotten sort of cocky but like what's there for me to be ashamed of and right. i oh wonderful it's wonderful yeah. so yeah it's it's, so it's funny how like our documentaries are kind of i mean there's music but yeah. the whole coming out thing is totally different yeah completely different and how you know it took it was a journey for shelly yes. whereas George was private about it, but also wasn't yeah. embarrassed and wasn't probably suicidal about it and things like that. So, you know, hmm. yeah, well, and he, I don't, yeah, I have no idea if he was suicidal or not, but he does talk. I mean, I'm at the point where, you know, I did my typical, like, oh no, I got to go read a bunch of things right. about this now. <laughs> uh, kind of not sure what's said where, but, you know, I kind of wonder would he still be here if he hadn't spent the first like 36 years of his career, you know, not of his career of his life, like closeted, like his friends knew he was gay, but like just Mm -hmm. that pressure and that like with it being a time of AIDS. I mean, one of the things I was saying to Neil recent, like this week that I don't know why I thought of it all of a sudden, but I was like, fuck man, if Freddie Mercury had been born like 20 years later, if so many of the people right. we lost had been born 20 years later we would have we would probably still have them They'll have them right because we have the medication now like talk about a moral failure the way you know the government refused to do anything or encourage research towards this medication but then it's like would freddie mercury have been able to make it big 20 years later or did he and queen have oh, to happen yeah. when they did because they were such a defining part of their era I don't know. It's all what if game stuff, but <laughs> you're right. Yeah, it's tough one. Go watch Freedom Uncut. It's so wonderful. You're going to want to listen to all the music afterwards. A couple of songs oh, might make you. Cry. I want to now. I want to now. <laughs> yes. Well, you text me about that. I'll text okay, you well. about alone. And okay. that's all for this episode. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for listening again, as always. If you've enjoyed the show and you haven't subscribed yet, I mean, maybe subscribe so that you'll know when we release a new episode please tell your friends about it and if you want to support us we do have links in our show notes to our coffee and the newsletter sign up or if you want to connect with us on your favorite social media sites we have links in the show notes for that as well or you can just search for curly recommended on instagram facebook tiktok and twitter or what we are not calling we're it not okay we're not gonna call it that Fuck it's twitter out. i hate Damn it i hate okay. that they i i hate that they <laughs> call, changed the name of the retweet oh. function it's really oh, what do they call it now repost repost oh because repost Boring. is also in threads yeah Boring. it's in threads too um oh yeah or email us at <laughs> podcast at queerly recommended.com goodbye everyone goodbye